Good evening, everyone. Great to see you all here. We'll just give another minute or so just to let people flow into the space and um, we'll get started in um, within a couple of minutes. Thanks everyone for joining this evening. Good evening and thank you for joining us for this evening's Current Perspectives. My name is Lisa Mayoni. I'm an assistant professor in graphic design here at the Kansas City Art Institute. And here at the Kansas City Art Institute, um, the land of the Kickapoo and Kansa and Osage people. We're pleased to welcome this evening's guest, Emma Nuzo, as this year's annual Hoffman Visiting Artist. The Hoffman Artist Endowment provides support to KCAI each year to host a distinguished artist or cultural practitioner working at the forefront of racial equity and social justice. We are grateful to Sharon and John Hoffman for their ongoing commitment to artists and their belief that artists play an important role imagining and creating change through their artistic and creative endeavors. Thank you, Sharon and John. Some of you may already be the beneficiaries of Emma Nuzo's work in the cultural realm. In the fall of 2018, leading up to the midterm elections, the artist-led organization Four Freedoms launched a 50-state initiative with a network of partners stretching across the United States to create a range of projects that took shape at colleges, museums, and public spaces throughout the country. The Kansas City Art Institute and the Art Space, as partners in that initiative, worked directly with Emma as the project lead for the initiative's vast national network. At a time where artists everywhere were reimagining their creative role as active civic agents, young artists at KCAI were invited to create and install freedom messages on campaign signs that were installed along the edges of campus, facing outward towards the community. Tonight, we meet Emma Nuzo once again to learn more about some of the artist actions that were inspired by Four Freedoms and how some of those ideas have evolved into new initiatives. Emma Nuzo is a curator, organizer, and educator working at the intersection of art and social impact. Central to her creative practice is the belief that art can encourage greater understanding and that in the face of inequity, each one of us is responsible for imagining and helping create the systems we wanna see in the world. Nuzo is the founder of Serious Art, an online platform that is reimagining the art, reimagining the art marketplace to empower individual independent artists and provide critical business education necessary to achieve longevity in their careers. Prior to starting her own business, Nuzo worked with artists and organizers as part of the Four Freedoms team for almost four years, collaborating directly with institutional partners across the country to produce exhibitions and programming that engender productive political dialogue and spark civic joy. She graduated from Williams College with a degree in art history and Africana studies. After the talk, we'll have a moderated Q&A for questions um, as you think of them. Please feel free to add them um, in the Q&A module and we'll be addressing those after the talk this evening. Please join me in welcoming Emma Nuzo. 
Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen. So one second till we get the technical part up. Okay. Um, well, wow, I feel like that was such a great introduction that I have little less to say on myself. Um, <laughs> I'm just joking, but I'm so honored to be here. I'm thankful not only to everyone at KCAI, but also to Sharon and John for making this possible. Um, for their championing of artists and change within the arts community, and for their critical role in starting for freedoms or helping starting for freedoms. Um, and their enduring support of me as I've embarked on creating my organization, Serious Art. They're truly a part of the journey that I've been asked to come speak about today, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, so as mentioned, I'm here to talk about Four Freedoms and Serious Art. One organization I've worked with for almost four years and another I started working on myself back in May, which launched in October of last year. And I'm also here to talk to you all about all of the in-between, how my experience with Four Freedoms and the values imbued in me by that organization helped shape the way that I found my own business, values such as listening until we hear, bringing more people into play and insisting on the future, to radically imagine new and better ways of existing in the world and to hurdle yourself full force into affecting that change. So just super quickly to introduce and contextualize serious art um, a little bit beyond the introduction. So these threads can come together during the presentation, but serious art is primarily a marketplace as mentioned to empower independent and emerging artists. We're a sales platform that strives for sustainability rather than profit, ensuring that maximum financial gain is passed on to the artist. Moreover, we think about the longevity of our artists' careers, both in providing critical business education, everything from financial planning and taxes to talking about your art to people who aren't in your crit class. Um, and finally, we're a coalition of young artists that stand in community together to provide mutual support, to share resources, and to help one another find paths to success, and to come together and question the traditional structure of representation and what it means for the careers of young artists. But just to start the presentation off, I really wanna tell the story of how I made it to Four Freedoms. Um, I graduated Williams College with the idea that many people have coming from liberal arts schools, which is that you can be the artist or you can be the curator, or maybe if you're lucky, you can be the critic um, or the scholar or the gallerist, but that's really mostly it. So school for me kind of felt like it was funneling me into one pathway, namely academia. Um, but I didn't really have an understanding of where I wanted to be in the art world. I just knew that I loved art. And for me, as I graduated, a lot of the artists from my thesis in college were represented by the Jack Shaneman Gallery. And so that was the first place I looked to settle. Um, but I quickly realized that I wasn't totally happy there. Um, don't get me wrong, of galleries, I actually love the Jack Shaneman Gallery. It's truly, it was truly a pleasure to work for them. They treated me really well. My coworkers were lovely. Um, we had a shared passion for the artists that were represented there and the work that was done. Um, this picture here on the screen is from when Four Freedoms actually held an exhibition at the Jack Shaneman Gallery the summer of 2016, at the same time I interviewed for the position there. The flag you see, um, is created by an artist named Dred Scott. And it's a resurrection of an old flag that used to be hung by the NAACP, put up again by Scott and Four Freedoms following the murders of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile. And I don't think that there are too, too many galleries who would hang a piece like this outside of their walls. And I'll do credit to the Jack Shaneman Gallery, but we know that just because a place shows great revolutionary art doesn't mean it always operates in a revolutionary manner. Um, for me, I think I knew that it was time to leave uh, when there was an incident where a woman, a fellow white woman, came in and uh, talked to me, as a lot of clients do, about the work on the wall and made a comment that I found a little bit problematic about the work of Black artists. And when I started a gentle conversation and asked her to explain the comment further, she retreated and I found out later that my boss said that she found me rude. 
I know for a fact that I wasn't being rude, but in the typical gallery world, collectors come first and the customer is always right. Um, so I could respect the mission of the Jack Shaneman Gallery to sell these amazing artists work, but it just wasn't in line with where I wanted to be relating to art. Um, still, my time there did lead me to Four Freedoms. Hank Willis Thomas, who is one of the co-founders of Four Freedoms, is represented by the Jack Shaneman Gallery and was also part of my senior thesis. Um, I was at the gallery and one of the women that I worked with mentioned that I should go check out this cool Four Freedoms town hall uh, being held that night at the International Center of Photography in New York City on freedom of speech. And I showed up and I participated, not really with like any idea or of a job in mind or knowing that I wanted to ask for a job, but knowing that I wanted to put myself in that space um, where art was being used to push dialogue and allow us to further investigate ourselves, that that was truly the environment I wanted to follow in whatever this amorphous, in quotations, art world was. And when I spoke up during the open dialogue portion of the program, it was interesting. Hank and I actually disagreed about something and we talked about it in front of everyone openly and with curiosity to learn more about why each other felt the way we did. And after the program, I knew that I needed to get his contact information. Um, and I could say this is probably the best thing that I've ever done for my career. And it is my number one advice to anyone starting out, not even starting out, but being in a creative field, which is to shoot your shot, say hi to the people that you respect, introduce yourself, ask if they're interested in exchanging information. You do not look over eager, you look passionate, you look like you know what you want and you really do never know what email can be the one email that changes your entire life. And I'm not exaggerating about that. Um, when I was looking for a job uh, less than a year later, I had temporarily left the art world um, to work with recidivists on doing mock job applications and practice job interviews. But I knew I wanted to come back and continue somewhere in the art, the amorphous art world that uh, fell in line with my values. And I reached out to Hank in Four Freedoms saying that I would be interested in any and all positions that they had available. Um, and again, I don't know where I would be today if I didn't send that email, but I certainly don't think I'd be here with you. Um, that's not to say that every single risk you're going to take is going to work out, um, but normally the best things that work out are going to require risk. Um, so I began working for Four Freedoms at the end of summer 2017. I had known Four Freedom as, as an organization that used art as a means to promote civic dialogue you, um, and as a catalyst for difficult conversation. And it is that, but at the same time, I'm so fortunate to have been with Four Freedoms since the inception, since we were six people. Um, because we're a little bit more like an art project than we are a typical organization. Our mission and methods of engagement and tone has evolved and sharpened over the years. And I've felt myself grow with that evolution. So Four Freedoms is an artist led organization that models and increases creative civic engagement, discourse and direct action. We work with artists and organizations to center the voices of artists in public discourse expand what participation in a democracy looks like and reshape conversations about politics. We are committed to creating a culture around the values of a listening, justice, healing, and awakening, and using art and creativity to spark civic joy. So at first, again, in 2017, when I was hired, I was an intern doing whatever tasks were being thrown at me. Um, but Throughout the entire time, I had a gut feeling that I wanted to be there, that I needed to keep showing up into that space because it was special. Um, it was nothing like the art world spaces I had occupied before. I felt like there was um, an understanding that we were all coming together, not just as creatives, but as individuals and humans, and that we were in there to do work together. Um, and so I knew something important was gonna come out of it. And I stuck around long enough to get hired full-time um, just a few months later and ending up be being asked to help to create the 50 state initiative, which 
is the project that uh, KCEI was involved in in 2018 and ended up being the largest creative collaboration in all of our nation's history. So, you know, boiling that down by having faith and nourishing the joy that I was feeling in this community, I went from answering Hank's emails in the back of a print shop to being put on calls and collaborating with curators and organizers across the country um, and kind of learning as I walked. I think um, first it's really critical for us to, or me to acknowledge that some of these opportunities to take a risk uh, come as a consequence of privilege. I was truly able to trust my gut and take a job with a brand new, still fundraising organization because I had the luxury of knowing no matter how it turned out, I wouldn't go hungry and my financial future was not going to be in turmoil. Um, and I knew how lucky I had gotten that these jobs and opportunities don't always go to the most qualified or the most talented, but those who are in the right place at the right time and are often led to those places by having good choices to make. But still, backtrack a second in 2017, when I did come on board, For Freedoms had only just started its work. It was a baby new organization. Um, they had mounted a billboard campaign in 2016, relatively tiny, teeny tiny, 16 billboards compared to what we do today. Um, and had also held an exhibition and done a few errant projects across the, con or across the country. But the goal for Four Freedoms was to amplify the effect that we were having in communities across the country and to spread it. Um, our co-founders, Hank and Eric Gottesman, wanted to go national, you know, to see if we could get a Four Freedoms exhibition program and public art piece in all 50 states. And as I mentioned, a couple months into my job there, they asked me to help them. Um, we had absolutely no idea what it would grow into. Uh, what started with an idea grew into a campaign of over 200 institutions holding almost 600 different activations in over 220 public billboards in all 50 states, DC and Puerto Rico, all leading up to the midterm elections between September 1st and November 6th of 2018. Um, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the partnering organizations because that's the part of the project that I personally led. Um, the billboards were also an amazing part of this, and I'm going to include some of the pictures for you all to see. But uh, this here on the wall is a visual representation of the project in its entirety. Each of the badges, um, there's only one per institution just because of the room that we had to make, but each different badge is for a different type of activation. So red means that there was a billboard there, um, green meant exhibition, blue, which is kind of harder to see, meant a town hall, which is what we called our public programming, and so on and so forth. Um, so the entire project though, it started really with building our team. Um, I was given a spreadsheet, a kind of like electronic Rolodex of about 60 or so people that either Hank or Eric knew from arts organizations across the country. And I reached out and emailed every single one of them about this new project saying, we are embarking on a project to map out the cultural infrastructure of the United States to come together as artistic and civic institutions and to see whose art to strengthen democracy, to open discourse, to drive dialogue and engender civic engagement. Um, and we would just ask anyone who would listen, do you wanna jump on the phone and talk about it? And so this was really one of the first values that stuck with me from Four Freedoms, which is you need to build your team, not just your immediate team, but as a teeny tiny organization being run by a group of artists, of colleagues, friends and collaborators, we can only affect so much change. But by calling more and more people into play at organizations big and small all across the country, and by not gatekeeping our participation, we were able to accomplish infinitely more than we could ever do alone. And ultimately, you know, we were building a coalition um, of like-minded institutions, galleries, museums, universities, uh, artist collectives, nonprofits, you name it, all across the country who are eager to come together and to together loudly raise the question, how can we use art to strengthen democracy? 
And as I keep talking, um, I'm going to be scrolling through some of the images that show some of the partner activations that happened in 2018. Um, this is a young woman who participated in our fill your own lawn sign event at the University of South Florida. You can see in the background that our lawn signs have uh, freedom from, freedom for, freedom to, and individuals for the community um, are invited to come in and fill them out and to kind of claim their freedom. Um, but so as we were building, you know, this project across the country with, you know, students such as those from USF, uh, we knew that we were going into the midterm elections. And I think most of you will know that midterm elections are local elections uh, where you vote for your state and local governments. So, you know, even more so, we knew that we didn't want to bring four freedoms into communities and dictate what programs or exhibitions that were happening there. Um, we actually operated by an idea often espoused by, espoused by Republicans, which is that local communities truly know what's best for local communities and we need to listen to them and help them lead um, and create change in their own spaces. They only like, um, they really also know their audience best, specifically in regards to different cultural institutions across the country. And it was our mission to create a structure of support and a guideline for them as they embarked on this campaign with us to drive civic engagement um, so that they could truly harness their own communities and uh, the voices within them to create programming that spoke to the individuals that came from those communities. Um, this is another one of the deep values that Poor Freedoms instilled in me, which is learning the power of radically listening, um, of always assuming that other people have so, so much to teach you, and that what is most critical is to build a network of support and to leverage power from the grassroots up. This is an exhibition at the New Britain Museum in Connecticut. I didn't mention that this is at the Norton Museum of Art in Florida. Um, here is at the Sun Valley Center in Idaho. And ultimately, as I mentioned, you know, during the 50 state initiative, we worked with over 250 institutions to put up over almost 600 exhibitions, public programs, performances, activities, gatherings, and more in all 50 states, DC and Puerto Rico. And they happened all across the country in all different ways. There were some that were small. There were some that were student-led. There were some that were, I wouldn't say impromptu, but a little bit more thrown together and organic. Um, there were performances, there were quilt-a-thons done by um, Moms Demand Action. Um, there were students at the University of New Mexico who activated the galleries in modern dance. You know, what was really amazing about the 50 State Initiative is though we created this toolkit for institutions to get involved by outlining, you know, how to put on an exhibition, how to do a town hall, which is our public program, how to do a lawn sign event, or how to create a billboard, the institutions came back to us with so, so many more creative ideas, ideas that we could have never come up with ourselves. Um, so I am, you know, coming out of being able to have a hand in some of these exhibitions and these programs, I personally felt that um, the programs that brought students or community members uh, to help shape and lead the discussions at these institutions always led to really candid and heartfelt conversations that ended up challenging institutional power and really helped to reshape what and how these institutions could work for the benefit of the people that they should be. Um, here's an image from the Cooper Gallery in, uh, at Harvard. Um, so you can see looking through these slides too that the diversity of programs is there. We had folks from the Brooklyn Museum to the University of Michigan to tiny arts collectives in the Bay Area come together and participate in what we were doing. Um, this is an image of one of my favorite activations that happened during the 50 State Initiative. The Resistance Revival Chorus um, came to Photoville, which is a photo festival, photojournalism and photography festival that happens in Brooklyn every year. And the Resistance Revival Chorus came to perform joy as a form of resistance um, underneath the Brooklyn Bridge. It was truly gorgeous. Um, this is an image 
uh, of a mural uh, and uh, sorry, it's done by an artist, Michelle Angela Ortiz. It was put um, outside of detention centers in Pennsylvania. Um, and so, you know, ultimately looking at the lessons of the 50 state initiative, nobody had told us to, uh, nobody had before done a nationwide project with so many simultaneous activations in the name of art and democracy. You know, nobody had tried, but that was no reason that we weren't going to try. And that lesson truly, truly stuck with me. And it primed me to understand how power can be harnessed when we lead with persistence and belief in our goals. And when we don't let the fact that something hasn't been done before dictate what can be done or exist in the future. Um, so these next few slides I'm gonna show are some of the billboards from the project because they're so beautiful and I couldn't not make space for them. Um, this one is uh, by Sanford Biggers. This is one by co-founder Hank Willis Thomas. This is also in St. Louis. Um, this is an absolutely amazing billboard by Jamila El -Sa uh, Sali. And the word here says human being. And this was a really, really impactful billboard that we mounted in 2018 in Rashida Tlaib's now district. Um, and it was really interesting because we had heard from local authorities and people in the community that there were a lot of people calling into the police station very concerned about, you know, this sign that they were seeing. And when they called in and asked, like, what, what's going on? The response was, ma'am or sir, or, you know, that it says human being. And so, you know, that's just kind of an example of how simple um, and catching these public artworks can be and what effect they can have on discourse on the ground. This is a billboard made by one of our other co-founders, Eric Gottesman. Um, this is one by Richard Rinaldi. And yeah, so those are some of the billboards, but you know, on top of all of the things that went around, for me personally, during the 50 state initiative, there was so much going on at all times, um, so much that you know it's hard to explain the amount of labor that it took to really pull it all off. But there were definitely a few moments specifically that made an impression on me regarding where I'd ultimately um, end up finding my passion in the arts. And the first was a trip that I took out to St. Louis to see one of Four Freedoms' partner exhibitions at a place called Projects Plus Gallery, curated by my friend Modu Deng. Um, this set of images, which I'm just gonna quickly go through so you can see. Um, this set of images were part of the exhibition. It was an amalgamation of talent at all different levels. Um, artists like Hank Willis Thomas and Michelle Pred were represented, but it truly were these images here that sang to me and an accompanying video piece. Um, and this is where I met Shabazz Jamal. He was an undergraduate at the time at the University of St. Louis, and I stayed in touch with him and followed his work. Um, he's now at Tulane uh, pursuing his MFA, and he's one of the artists on the Sirius platform. And at this same show, um, I also met and befriended another young artist. I fell in love with her work as well. This is a piece by Esma Muhammad, another emerging artist, now 26 years old, but from Canada. Um, and again, I was more drawn to this piece than almost anything else in the gallery. And this little thread will come back up in just a second. Um, you know, another informative moment, I'm so blessed to be part of the Four Freedoms team and be able to embark on creative uh, projects of my own. During the 50 State Initiative, I also cur co-curated my first exhibition here in New York City at a gal gallery called Fort Gansevoort. Um, it was called My Silences Had Not Protected Me, a quote taken from an Audre Lorde essay of the same name. Um, and this exhibition was a united collection of women and femme identifying artists who together represented the multidimensional intricacies of female sexuality and its inherent relationship to power. It was an exhibition meant to challenge the viewer to confront the ways in which societal narratives of female sexuality are formed and communicated. 
central to this exhibition was the idea of power, how sexuality can both be an object of abuse by the powerful and a source of power for those who wield it. And I worked on it with one of the team members at Fort Gansevoort. It was a Force Freedoms project. Um, and in the show, I was so lucky to be able to, co to curate in some of my all-time favorite artists of all time, Carrie Mae Weems, Ana Mendieta, Men Marilyn Minter, Lava Thomas. Um, you'll see Lava Thomas's uh, sculpture here on the wall. Carrie Mae Weems is this one here. This is a Lorraine O'Grady. Um, and then this image uh, is the video piece by Marilyn Minter. Um, but somehow I was still most excited to bring in this piece by Esma Mohammed. When I found out that I had the opportunity to curate a show in New York City and I wanted it to be all women and femme identifying artists, I reached out to her right away. To me, her work was so fresh and exciting and relatable. And I was so, so thrilled to get to bring it into that show, perhaps for no other reason than it was just exciting for me to leverage this new work next to the pieces by some of the folks that I considered masters. Um, to me, that felt congruent. It felt like a congruent thought. It felt like a natural progression. Um, and it felt like a declaration that I wanted to make, that I wanted to be involved with. And we made it happen. And her work stood right next to Ana Mendieta's. This is a picture of my best friend, Justin, um, who was at the opening. And you can see that it's a piece that speaks to people all around. Um, fast forward a few months, Four Freedoms held a residency at ICP, again, here in New York City. Uh, we were working in a room surrounded by the documentation of the 50 state initiative. This is in early 2019. And part of our residency was allowing for our team members to curate and produce different activations in the space. And I knew for me, the one that I felt most passionately about was realizing a performance night that I had imagined up during my curation of my silences hadn't protected me, um, but that there was now budget for such a program. Um, and, you know, in curating this program, I wasn't really interested in finding artists who were established or farther on in their careers. I wanted to hear from the women and femmes navigating the beginning of their adulthood and grappling with it like I was. From those whose perspectives are fresh and deserved a place in today, uh, a place to breathe and steeped in the reality of today's challenges. And it didn't mean, and it doesn't mean that I'm not interested in what other older, more seasoned artists experiences were and are, but that I wanted to find an opportunity to uplift ours. Um, so often the voices of young people, both children, teens, and young adults are underestimated. And the group here was absolutely, truly phenomenal. Um, I wish I had more video to be able to show, but in this group, uh, there's representation of dance, um, poetry, movement art, spoken word, comedy, photography. Um, our leader there in the yellow, Agemdi Ude, they are a doula. It was a multi, multi-talented group of women and femmes who really just led an inspiring, inspiring night. Um, it sort of, I think there's an honesty that I sometimes feel from working with young artists who are more prone to making mistakes and to exploring and who are still finding their voice. I think it's because for me, art is really about connection. And sometimes it makes it feel more authentic to connect with artists who are also still trying to figure everything out. Um, this is actually just a little shout out. This is one of the interns that I worked with for the Four Freedoms 50 State Initiative. And I was so, so happy to get to invite her back into the Four Freedoms world um, as an artist, as a spoken word performer, Mirabella Spotty. Um, it was absolutely gorgeous piece that she wrote and performed herself. And from that night, one of the artists that I met through curating that performance night was Sydney King, um, a young photographer that was living and working in Brooklyn, New York. Another activation at our residency at ICP, um, we mounted some of her work on the walls, her and I, um, her contribution to portrait photography. She was one of the artists that uh, were in the performance night, but she gave a, 
a presentation on her photography and I kind of fell in love not only with her work, but with the way that her mind worked with it. Um, what was crazy was despite having, you know, and then we, we worked together to curate uh, a set of images onto the walls at ICP. And what was really interesting is that above us, you know, you can see in this image that our residency was on the ground or basement floor. And above us, there was a portrait photography show, but I really did believe that Sydney's approach to portrait photography was more stunning and gripping and question provoking and provocative than what I was finding upstairs. Um, and I absolutely cherished the opportunity to work with her because I felt like we were getting to work on something together. And again, it felt really important and powerful to have her work, uh, share space with photographers like Carrie Mae Weems and Gordon Parks. Again, another declaration of worth that I wanted to be part of and help affect. And I know that this part might start sounding like a broken record, but each of these experiences was pushing me closer to um, the work I'd ultimately embark on for serious art. And yes, uh, Sydney is also now one of the artists on the Sirius platform. This is some of the work that we put up. I really regret that I had a hard time finding images of the installation. It's buried deep on the Four Freedoms Google Drive, but you can see uh, this work here. It's actually part of her thesis show from uh, college. She graduated in Princeton 2017. Um, and all of this work is manipulated in darkroom, which I find absolutely stunning. Um, uh, but the rest of 2019 went on with some several small projects, which I'm not going to go in depth through just because of time, but I'm going to ask Grace to play the video now um, that we have. Four Freedoms is an initiative to promote civic engagement. A collective of artists, culture makers, and organizations from across the country. People in Kansas, Kentucky, Los Angeles are creatively thinking about how to solve their own problems. The Congress here is going to build upon the existing creative cultural infrastructure of the United States. The imagination, storytelling, the arts, along with experts in economics and policy. Broader discussion about the issues that affect and shape our society. We wanted to bridge the gap between what happens in the institutions and what happens on the streets. Talk about the state of our democracy and learn from each other, listen to each other. The creative plan of action for 2020 is the tangible, the deliverable that will come out of this Congress. People will present their findings and also make declarations and intentions that will be incorporated into the plan. We have talent and skills. We can use them. Creating, building, innovating, healing. We all have our own designs and languages and traditions. We're not all alike, but we are alike in most ways. An artist's role to me is to help bridge the communication gap to express ourselves with images that speak louder than words. Artists create not just because they want to make a painting or a sculpture or a song. They're shaping the society and responding to the society that surrounds them. If we want to build a new future, we do need creatives involved. Art also has the power to envision beyond what is in front of us. Being a reflection of what's there, but also imagining what should be there. The artists that we celebrate are the ones who do that very well. Each of us have different talents and different capacity. None of us can do it alone, and we need each other's help. This Congress and this work will help us take one step further to actually something we've never seen. With courage to the kids who I wouldn't live. be where I'm at had it not been for other people, what they've endured and what they've imagined and created space for. Thank you for freedoms. Thank you, Los Angeles. The role of an artist in 2020 is to be active. People want to be together and in conversation together, and we can't ever lose that. My children, my grandchildren, I want them to be proud of who they are, to go forward and to be outspoken and to fight for the rights. 
remind yourself that you're not in this alone. There's people who are addressing these similar scenarios in very creative and genius ways. It's an honor to be here. It's very inspirational. Thank you for your time. So I wanted to show that clip partially because I think it, you know, explains in uh, really eloquent terms exactly what the Four Freedoms Congress was. Um, in the beginning of 2020, we all kind of came together to radically imagine a different future, a more just future, a more equitable one. Um, sorry, something just popped up on my screen. I apologize. Um, we came together to imagine a better future, a more just future, a more equitable one, um, a future where our culture is based in listening, healing, and justice, and one where we acknowledge and learn and make amends from the actions of our past, um, where we work together to build a way forward, where, no slides, okay, I'm so sorry. Um, let me unshare my screen real quick. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Is that better? Okay. Um, okay, so sorry about that technical difficulty, everybody. Um, anyways, to go on, I'm saying that, uh, you know, we were all there to imagine a better future um, in a culture that is based in listening, healing, justice, and awakening. One where we're acknowledging and listening to make amends for the actions of our past um, and to work together to build a better way forward, where through connectivity and collaboration, immense and complex ideas seemed conquerable, truly. Um, there was a spirit of togetherness, of respect, and of being open to collaborating with anyone around you. Um, and quite honestly, there was love present there. And I'm talking about a kind of impersonal love. Um, that means that I don't have to know you to love you um, and to care about your ontological being and to want to fight so that your opportunities are equal to mine and equal to others. And over my time at Four Freedoms, I've learned that love is an action word and that we must actively fight to love and to make space for the futures that we want. Um, so the Congress came about 10 days before New York City went into lockdown. And like everyone else at the beginning of the pandemic, um, I had a lot of time. And the injustices of the world were really thrown into stark relief, you know, of our general society. But for me, also thinking more about the art world. And for the first time in a long time, I had time to sit down and to reflect on the work that I was doing rather than just like powering through to get it done and to, you know, get, produce that next program and get the 50 state or get the Congress up and running. I really had time to sit and meditate with what I wanted to affect in the world. Um, and also to reflect on whether what I was contributing through my labor was truly in line with the absolute most passionate part of my being. And the answer was kind of, but not fully. Um, so again, sitting with my thoughts day after day, <laughs> I you know wondered why there wasn't a gallery or a marketplace or something that specifically sold student and independent artwork. Um, I knew from my friends from college and high school who were in different paths and starting to reach an age in financial security where art seemed like an interesting investment, um, hopefully art that's under 40k, you know, I knew there was demand, but I hadn't seen any supply um, being created in a kind of condensed or consolidated way. And Sirius started with um, and that is, you know, one aspect of knowing that this is a business that I wanted to embark on, but it really was more about 
looking at the conditions of what it's like to be a young artist and trying to trying to change uh, the outlook of so many young creatives coming out of traditional academic programs. Um, you know, Sirius started with an undeniable truth, which is that, you know, making it or being financially stable based purely on your practice is really, really hard and that it is made even harder um, for BIPOC artists. And the statistics bear out that 91% of artists who graduate with an MFA um, never make a living off of their practice. So of the 9% who do, 81% of those are cisgendered white men. Um, that means only 1.7% of people graduating with an MFA are BIPOC or white women artists that make it. That doesn't even control for white women. Um, and going into this, you know, I know there were so many reasons that this was the case. There are factors in the quote art world, art market that, you know, are mirrored in society, white supremacy, bias, things that I'm not really saying that we have the effect, to, we serious had the effect to make on the market, but it did seem clear that there was a socioeconomic factor in play here too, that wealth inequities playing out in our society and um, making the effects, uh, making the effects of becoming an artist even harder, being that if you graduate from an institution and you're not crippled in debt, or um, you know that no matter what you have your next meal, um, or that you don't have to send money home, you know, it you can focus on your art and not your food and your rent a little bit. You know, you have not only more um, actual time in your life because maybe you don't have to take up a se that second job, but you also have more mental energy to be able to devote into becoming the artist that you can become. Um, and so it isn't even necessarily financial security to be a gatekeeper. There's the reality that the market is very white and ma very male. And that if we care about embedding further equity into this amorphous art world, we need to make a conscious effort to do so. Um, and I think there's this idea um, where when we, if we make spaces and hold spaces specifically for artists of color, specifically for women and femmes, or specifically for queer artists, there's something about that that makes a lot of white people wonder um, or say, you know, well, where do I fit into that? And my answer to that is sometimes you don't, sometimes we don't. Um, and if we truly want to have a world where there is finally an equal playing field, we have to equal the, equalize the playing field. That means creating spaces for specific empowerment to redistribute opportunities. Um, meritocracy is a myth and in the art world, it is practically a fairy tale. Um, so we need to be intentional with the change that we want to see in order to realize it. On top of all this, being a young person working with artist peers, I also saw how even when they were given an opportunity through a gallery um, and they had something big happen for them, it didn't mean that the gallery or institution had much, if any, stake in seeing them succeed long term. It was really more um, institutions, galleries, organizations using their work, uh, the, using their cultural currency to strengthen their own agenda, securing and consigning artwork for an exhibition. Even if the act was some ways mutually beneficial, there wasn't a specific space out there whose first priority was to empower artists first through the sale of their work. Um, so then again, I thought, I wanna make a marketplace that existed not to make a profit off of artists' work, but to set them up for success in their careers, um, helping them reach for further financial stability and in the process, investing in them prov by providing these business uh, educational opportunities and guidance. Um, and that whatever financial gain was produced by the sale of the work was passed on to the artist. So that's really how we function. Um, we are an online marketplace that supports these artists to sell their work, but we give them complete control and autonomy over the conditions of the sale of their work. 
Sirius handles the administrative lift of holding contracts, processing money, um, doing some of the marketing, ensuring that the work is listed and presented well. And we also provide counseling or counsel on things like pricing and curation, and even things like career advice to any artist on the platform that asks for it. But this is something that they have to opt into. And the very point of Sirius is to create maximum autonomy for these artists. Um, one of the things I really wanted to avoid is the feeling that on the platform, me or Sirius or any entity was trying to help shape their careers. Um, we are trying to do the exact opposite. We're trying to give them the skills and the tools needed for them to shape their own careers. And in doing so, um, an informed way so that when they go off, they can conduct themselves in an informed and educated manner. You know that, or you know, it's my belief that galleries profit off of the fact that not only do artists not know a lot of this business stuff, but there's this culture out there that assumes, well, you should know, um, or you know, you you should know what. Uh, how to price your work, or you should know about resale contracts when really who's there to teach you. Um, so one of the most important parts of being able to navigate your career is having that business knowledge and most schools do not provide it. Um, and it's our mission to be able to set artists up for that success. And because I am not, uh, it's kind of like, that old teach a man to fish line, right? Where metaphorically we wanna teach our artists to fish, not only so that they thrive independently, but so that they can continue in the driver's seat of their own careers. Um, and for the business education part, we provide intimate Zoom seminars on all sorts of topics. Um, you know, Last week, we or a few weeks ago, we ran a workshop where each of our attendees got to practice their elevator pitch and help develop it for those instances when you meet a curator with only 45 seconds of their attention. We've had different um, artists like Nate Lewis, a little bit more established, come and talk to our, the artists on our platform about some of the things he's found really helpful in navigating his own career. Um, and as much as I know that, uh, as much as I know that it's crucial for my time to work with the artists, ultimately, I am not a visual artist, and I am creating a platform for them. So that's where, and this is where the radical listening really has continued to play into a really major part of this project. Um, ultimately, they're guiding me on what they want to learn in the educational program. Even the little decisions that are made at the front of this conversation, you know, they help me frame the project as working with, quote, independent and emerging artists, whereas before I had actually been marketing it using the words student and independent, but they expressly expressed to me that they didn't want the word student in there because they didn't agree that that should have any sort of conditioning to what their work was. Um, so perhaps what I'm currently most proud of is the community that serious artists are creating together. Um, what started out again as an idea for just an online marketplace has be, kind of become a cohort or a coalition of young artists here to come together for mutual support. Um, this is an image, unfortunately, I forgot to put things in gallery view, but this is just some of the screenshots I got of a few of them on our all artists convening call this Tuesday. But, um, you know, we all agree that we are stronger in numbers and that serious artists are connected to share opportunities to make room for collaborations or connections wherever possible and generally to follow, encourage and be a part of each other's lives and practices. Um, these are just some of the artists who joined us on Tuesday so we could plan even more ways to continue to stay connected and to build our team and our family stronger and better. You know, we're finding now times to do things like Zoom studio visits with each other um, where we can critique and open up dialogue about each other's work. We're going to be learning about NFTs together and having the sticky conversations around what it means for our futures and our lives, both them and me. 
Um, and, you know, we get to also come together to talk about experiences or they get to come together and talk about experiences that they've shared or that they can run by each other that they might come across as young BIPOC artists in this space. Um, but ultimately, you know, I'm chasing that same feeling of love at Sirius that has been held at Four Freedoms um, and remembering the values that are most important to create a true movement, which is that it is crucial to bring people into play, that what is needed is not charity, but empowerment and systemic change, that people are most empowered when they are given tools to empower themselves and that people know best how to help themselves and we must listen until we hear. That just because something hasn't been done before or you don't see your ideas or values existing already in society doesn't mean that they can't. It means that you should find your team and go and get to work. So with that, I wanna say thank you to everybody and invite questions. Emma, amazing. <laughs> First of all, let's all give a, a probably a very quiet but resounding round of applause for that presentation. Um, we have one question in the Q and A, um, and uh, possibly a couple of hands. So we'll just go through here. Um, Alicia asks, how do you sustain relationships with the organizations and people you connect with across the country, having such a pivotal role um, as the sort of the networker connector and expander of the Four Freedoms Project and so many of the other initiatives? Well, it's interesting because um, for Four Freedoms, you know, we are a network there too. When I was signing up people to be part of the 50 state initiative, we were kind of sneaky. We we're like, you want to be a Four Freedoms partner and be part of this project? And by becoming part of this project, they kind of became a Four Freedoms partner. You know, I had that, that contact information and you just continue to reach out and check in on people. Um, you know, one of the greatest pleasures I've had at Four Freedoms is to be the one who's kind of fostered the relationship between our partners um, and tried to, tried to make sure that it's something that is both mutually beneficial and mutually supportive. Absolutely. Um, there's a couple of folks with raised hands. I'm not sure um, if we can hear you, but if you want to send me um, the question. Oh, Rachel also has a raised hand. So I'll, I'll look for those other questions and um, Rachel, you can pop in. Okay, I'll, I'll await, I'll await the news. Um, let's see. Um, there was a, um, oh, you allowed them to speak. Oh, perfect, perfect. Okay, so, um, uh, so Grace, would you, um, I think we have a question from Jose. Yes, fantastic, thank you. Uh, and Jose, if you wanna unmic, uh, we can hear you and we'll be able to see you on, on, our, on our Zoom stage, as it were. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, I was really uh, by the kind of wide reach of the project. And I, I wanna know if that's kind of like something we should all be thinking about instead of being so insulated and caught up in something perhaps going further out of field as the artist. Yeah, I mean, I think that as an artist, we should constantly be questioning like why we're doing the things that we're doing. And I consider myself an artist. I'm not a visual artist, but an artist is anyone who is a creative who has ideas that they bring into the world that didn't exist before. Um, I think it's just always really important to think really critically about the structures that we participate in. Um, I'm sorry, did I answer your question? Yeah, no, I did. I think it is that idea of questioning those structures, actually trying to figure out how to dismantle them or rebuild them in a better, a more equitable way. But I, that really resonates. Yeah, and I think what's really critical specifically about Sirius and something we all say to each other is that, you know, they just look at us as like a group of 17 really talented young creatives now, but the more and more artists that join our league and start to question the way the gallery representation works, those galleries might be sweating soon, so.
Okay, great. Um, Ava Herring has a question. Um, Ava, we'll invite you up. Hey, um, so I think it's really awesome, first of all, that like you really did push to make work that matters and like everybody wants to make work that matters, like air quotes around that. But um, it's amazing to see too, like how you question what are you doing to really make work that matters? Uh, and my question was, what are ways that students can be better allies, um, either through per, like personal work or just through like their own uh, academic work that they're doing, just as friends or you know people in general. Um, yeah. Thank you all. Oh, of course. Um, I think that word ally is interesting. I would use more co-conspirator. Um, we should together co-conspire to figure out how we can make the world into what we want to make it. Um, and as students, you know, sometimes obviously things are limited. Um, you have the reality that you got to go to school, that you're paying a lot of money for it and you want to learn and that that degree at the end of the day is going to get you somewhere. But simultaneously, don't underestimate what you can get done when you are persistent. You know, I've seen a lot of student artists um, like mount different community projects just by reaching out to different groups that exist within their community, you know, to put on dialogue, to put on public art, you know, uh, displays. I think also as students, it's really critical to start to build your knowledge and just think about like, okay, where am I going to place myself when this is all done? Like I said, when I graduated from liberal arts college, it was like, okay, you can like work at a gallery or you can go get your PhD or you can be an artist. And that's just not the case, you know? Um, and I think more and more nowadays as these sorts of alternative artistic structures are built, you know, there are gonna be more options. So I would say as a student, A, try to think about what in your local community you can affect. Um, just as like a little plug, I wrote a billboard curriculum for university students that you can see at forfreedoms.org um, in case you want to do a billboard project. But, you know, it's really just leveraging. Look at the resources around you. That means your friends, your professors, the organizations in your community. Um, look at who you can bring on your team and see what you want to affect and just go after it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I think the one of the last things you said in your talk is also resonating with me. Find your team and get to work. Like find find your people. Um, a couple of questions here about um, team building strategies. Um, so can you talk a bit about team building strategies and using a shared platform for envisioning and managing projects versus hierarchical structures? Yes. So that's a really interesting one uh, for me because I haven't worked at a hierarchical structure since I worked like doing my job helping recidivists um, for freedoms is a completely horizontal structure and it can get messy. It can. Um, but I think that a good strategy for creating structures that are horizontal where everybody has an equal say, um, it's a lot about trust you really do need to build in that level of trust with other people and the idea that everything is happening in good faith. Um, you know, there's something that I believe in ego death, which is just that like what we're doing isn't important that it is the collective and uh, hierarchical or non-hierarchical structures can go very wrong when they claim to be non-hierarchical and then there are a few people who are leading. But if there's truly a commitment to recheck the culture on a consistent basis and to check in with everybody on the team, you know, both in Four Freedoms and with my artists at Serious Art, I found that that's the best way to make sure that everybody feels attended to everyone feels like their voice is equal and everyone feels like they can pitch in. I appreciate that. Yeah, I think there's so many so many contexts in which building teams, building building trust, um, so critical um, and such a, such a, it can feel like such a careful sort of um, uh, uh, plant, but somehow I think you said nourishing a few times in your presentation as well, somehow sort of like growing a team, sort of like finding or entering a space as much as sort of creating a space. Completely. Um, yeah. 
another question here. Um, can you share some of your thoughts about NFTs? I was giggling because I saw a little preview of that in the chat and I knew that somebody was going to ask me about them. Um, truly, I'm learning more and more. I will be extremely candid because that is my personality and what I believe in that right now, I'm a little bit nervous about them. They make me feel a little yucky. And that is because I think that it creates a cultural shift where art is seen more as an investment and asset and less viewed as the cultural currency that it is. Um, and that is not to say that there aren't most you know, collectors out there who also see work as cultural or as investment, because that's the truth. Even me who collects art, you know, sees it as investment. Um, but there seems to be a shift where people are going and getting the NFT for the value of that. And like, oh, well, a cool picture comes with it. Um, and I understand that that's not everybody there, but that's kind of like some of what I've been sensing simultaneously having an NFT, like the structural part of it, if it weren't so bad for the environment is pretty cool. Um, I don't know if y'all know about resale contracts, but essentially like if you sell a piece of work, you normally say to the buyer, you can't sell within a certain amount of time. And if you sell past this, and you make X, you have to give the artist 10% of like whatever extra was made, you know? And the possibilities that come with being able to digitally track that, it, it's amazing. Like it's, it's becoming super lucrative, but I also want to emphasize that it's becoming super lucrative for some people. And like a lot of things that come up really quickly, I am very cognizant that it could crash really quickly. Um, I encourage anybody who's interested to take a dive into them, but to also perhaps view them as something next to what we might call like the art market. It's, just, I don't know. And also I wanna like say after that, that I'm not the expert in NFTs. This is just my opinion as somebody who's like newly embarking into learning about them. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, are there any other last burning questions in the audience, whether through the Q&A module or um, you can raise your hand as well? Um, yeah, I mean, things that, um, that, I, that I heard you say this evening, nourishing the community, um, spark civic joy, um, uh, the amplify the effect. Um, oh, also like loudly raising the question. I love that um, just that act, the, the vision of that activity um, to do some, to raise a voice together or to, to come together to um, in a project, um, creating mutual strength and, um, and a structure of support. Um, all of that seems so resonant with um, so many of the conversations across um, uh, multiple sectors and so incredible to see um, the way that you're working be, uh, you know, such, such a, 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 again, nourishing maybe part of um, so many artists, um, both early and emerging and sustaining moments. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, oh, there's one other question here. Um, you made one comment about not gatekeeping participation. Would you unpack that a bit? Yeah, so, you know, when we were embarking on the 50 state initiative, uh, it was me call. So <laughs> I started at Four Freedoms. I was an intern. I started the process of reaching out to people. I was the first emailer, but then when I would jump on calls, um, it would be uh, me and uh, the director of Four Freedoms. And we would be, you know, like kind of tag teaming it. Um, sorry, will you just remind me of the question? My, my brain just completely. Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, can you unpack uh, this? Uh, you made a comment about gatekeeping, not gatekeeping participation. participation. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> I'm, I'm clearly exhausted after a long night. But anyway, um, so, you know, after uh, I was, you know, on those calls with the director uh, for about a month before she popped out a baby. And after that, it was really me handling calls with over 250 organizations in all 50 states, DC and Puerto Rico. And at the end of the day, you know, 
not only did we not have time to do like really deep research into what every organization was and whether we like really wanted to be affiliated to them, it was kind of more like, okay, like problematic or not, like we're all kind of problematic. You know, uh, if you want to come be part of this project, like please come embark in it with us. And if there's something to discuss, we will discuss it. Um, so in terms of gatekeeping, like ensuring that A, the barrier to entry for any organization, despite their financial backing was low. You had to pay nothing to be involved in Four Freedoms and you could do whatever you wanted to do. Um, there, you know, was no like limit, um, high or low, but also just the idea that we're not trying to um, investigate, you know, the team at every organization we're working with. We're really just trying to be inclusive and anybody who wants to play this if infinite game with us can come in. Great. We have two last questions. Um, one, Serious Art, where does that name come from? Okay, so, um, so Sirius is a type of cactus that has a flower that blooms only at night and for one night only. They open their petals um, at dusk and they are wilted by dawn. And I thought that it was a really beautiful metaphor for the way that emerging young artists can be. Um, you know, similarly to how we operate in opposition to the gallery structure, serious flowers operate completely different to typical flowers. And they're objects of wonder that you have to go seek out. And they're kind of like hidden and you have to look for them. Um, and when you do see them, they're kind of like awe-inspiring and different and just gorgeous in, in an otherworldly way. And, you know, truthfully also they're some of the flowers that grow along the path where my mother went to high school, my mom and my mom's family is from Honolulu. Um, and my grandmother, who is a Chicana artist, she and I, as when I was a child would go searching for them. And so, you know, um, this project is also a little personal because I would love for her to have been able to um, make her own money a little bit better as an artist, as an independent artist when she was younger, but also I just think that the flower itself is really symbolically aligned with our mission. Thank you, that's wonderful. I love hearing that story. Um, and we have Sharon Hoffman have a question. Okay. Um, you can, yeah. Hi, Sharon. <laughs> Hello. Hey, John. Hi. So uh, the plan is there's two parts to this is that Emma will uh, come in in the fall and uh, meet with um, the students in studio. And would you just uh, discuss that a little bit, your ideas on that? Yeah, I'm super excited. I mean, obviously it all kind of depends on what's possible in the fall, but I'm really excited to come in and meet with students because Sirius is an organization that represents both students and graduated artists. So A, you know, looking for new talent, but B, I think it's always great to come in and to foster an environment um, of abundance where, you know, so often I feel like in art, in art schools, in art settings, you know, if you get that show, I don't. If, um, if you sell that piece, then like I might not get to that collector. And so coming to campus this fall, not only do I want to be there to, you know, give the advice that I give to my serious artists about their practice, you know, talk to them about what it's like to start your career and really, you know, imbue this sense of empowerment within the young artists, but also, um, you know, see who might want to join the team. Fantastic. So exciting that you're coming in the fall. Like let's, let's all cross our fingers, all, all the fingers that we have. Um, fabulous. Thank you. And thank you for that question, John. And John yeah, thanks, and Sharon. John. Yeah, thank you all again uh, for this wonderful opportunity to be able to uh, meet with and hear from, from Emma Nuzzo. Um, any last um, piece of advice, um, uh, burning, burning questions that you have for, for future uh, and emerging artists before we wrap tonight? Not questions, but again, if I can leave you with one thing is shoot your shot. I don't know if I'd be here talking to you tonight if I didn't go very nervously 
approach one of the artists that I had written my thesis about and ask him if he wanted to talk more. So that doesn't mean I'm special. That means that you need to have gall and just, just do it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for this evening. Thank you, everybody. It's been a pleasure. Do clapping with our with our with our raising hands. Um, well, thank you for being here, Emma, um, and looking forward to meeting you and seeing you this fall. Sharon, John Hoffman, thank you so much um, for this wonderful opportunity to connect us all, um, Art Space, and um, everyone on the Visiting Artists Working Group, um, including Rachel Smith here on the call. Thank you all, and looking forward to continuing all of these conversations and the inspiration that comes from it. So, all right. Well, thanks everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. Emma. Bye. Thanks everybody.